Hi, this is Zach Morgenstern back with one of my few non-music videos. A while ago, I revisited an important book from my childhood. That book was called The Tagarung by Brian Jakes. I put it out as my first booktube video. As a result of uh, promoting that video a little bit, I discovered an Instagram account called Lottie, the lost mouse made of Red Ball. And uh, if you're seeing this Lottie, your, your page meant a lot to me because, you know, of lots of the big media that were important in my childhood, it's fairly easy to find a nostalgic community for them. You know, I was a big Pokemon head and you find plenty of Pokemon adults to this day. Harry Potter, Disney, even a little bit the series of unfortunate events. There's lots of children's media where you can find a sort of lifelong fandom for them. Red Bull, on the other hand, that felt like a thing that was big in the ch in children's bookstores in, in the 90s and early 2000s, but since then has kind of disappeared from popular discourse. So I was very happy to discover Lottie's Instagram page where she creates these Red Ball memes reminding you of the moods and characters from these books. And then she started doing a thing where she was doing a Discord read-along of the Red Ball books. And though I'm not yet quite caught up with the pace at which Lottie and uh, the other people on that Discord are reading, it nonetheless inspired me to revisit these books and see what they are like. So one thing to note here is that there are two orders for reading Red Wall books, uh, or at least the, thirst, the first 13 books of the series. There are 22 in total. But as a child, I followed the order that was listed on the back of the books right here. This is the order in which the books take place chronologically in Redwall's internal fictional hi history. Many purist fans of the books, however, don't read them in that order, despite what the publisher says. Uh, they read them in the order in which Brian Jakes wrote them. And I believe that is the order in which Brian Jakes encourages you to read them because it allows for you to experience revelations. You know, when he references a character in one book and then revisits them in their actual chronological moment, Later, you're supposed to say, oh, I recognize that reference from before, not just be like, oh, yeah, of course, we're now at that point in Red Ball history. So, so I, when I read these books as a kid, I unfortunately did read them in the order in which they took place chronologically. I started with a book called Martin the Warrior, Martin being the most famous hero of the Red Ball books who is referenced in all these books. However, Martin is not the hero of the very first Red Ball book the Redwall book simply called Redwall. So I have to say, when I read this book as a nine-year-old kid, I didn't question why the seventh book in the series just had the title of the series. I assumed he just randomly wanted to call one of the books Redwall. You know, it didn't occur to me that this was actually the book he wrote first. But just like, you know, kids today might think of the movie just called Star Wars as the fourth Star Wars movie, when it was actually the one that started the series, Right here, we have the book just called Redwall because it was the very first Redwall. So, you know, even though Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin are historically older in the Star Wars lore, the original Star Wars hero is Luke Skywalker. And similarly, the original Redwall hero is not Martin the Warrior, but it is Matthias, who starts out as an ordinary little mouse living in Redwall Abbey. So what I appreciate about reading this book as an adult, as opposed to as a child, is that I could really appreciate that it was this first book and the difference between it and these other books that I vaguely remember from reading them before. Apparently the story with this book is Brian Jakes didn't even mean it to be published necessarily. He got inspired from volunteer work he did with children. He wrote the manuscript for a children's novel and he sent it to a friend and he said, you like it? And he said, I like it so much. I sent it to a publishing house and they're going to publish it. So reading this book, both as a rebirth of my relationship to Redwall, but also knowing the series quite well, I noticed a few things. First, virtually all of the good characters in this book have English human names. Their names include Matthias, Methuselah, Mortimer, Alp, Hugo, Winifred, Jess, Sam, and Constance. As a kid, I didn't pick up on this because in the other books, occasionally you have English human names, and the villains in this book have typical villain names. But in later books in the series, he would sort of make up animalish names for heroes and villains alike. Secondly, the logic of the series isn't quite as solidified as of this book. So one of the weird things about Redwall, the series, is that even though it's the series about animals, as you know, as you can see, you have warrior rats on the cover, you know, it's not like A Bug's Life or Charlotte's Web or Country Mouse and City Mouse, where the animals actually live as animals, you know, below the feet of human society. 
rather than most of the Redwall books, it's it's kind of like furries, you know, it's basically humans, but they look like animals, they have fur and paws and whiskers, and they're described as animal species. In this first book, there's more explanation of uh, the animals actually being animals. For one, there are clear pieces of human infrastructure, like a horse cart, a church, and goat cheese. The wise old Methuselah the mouse is said to have the ability to speak in different tongues, and thus has this unique ability to speak to different kinds of species. He can speak the language of the bees. And one of the main plot points of the book uh, involves his protege, again, our hero, Matthias, learning to speak the not quite different language, but dialect of the sparrows. The idea that you have different animal species with completely separate culture, that's not as clearly defined in the, in the later books, where basically you just have humanoid animals and animals that are completely animals and thus out of access to the humanoid animals. Another thing that seems to be going on with this book is Jake's is more committed to the idea of animals being their actual sizes relative to one another. So there's one scene where Matthias rides on the back of a cat. In the later books, where there are while there are certainly moderate size differences, you know, the badgers always are like the big buff athlete warriors, it generally comes across as the animals are more or less within the same range of sizes as different humans would be from one another. And this is kind of practical because like, how are you supposed to have a sword fight between a mouse and a stoat? You know, if the stoat is towering over the mouse, you know, if anything, the mouse just runs over with his sword and pokes the stoat in the belly. A final thing I want to say, because this is the first book, every time Brian Jakes talks about a new species, he's full of energy and inspiration. I think the strongest part of this book came when Matthias was discovering the sparrow civilization that tensely exists above the abbey. Uh, because the rest of the books have narrower rules about what species exist and whether they relate to one another or not, you're not going to see characters like these again. But I did very much like the bond that developed between Matthias and Warbeak the Sparrow and how the whole arc within the Sparrow's Nest, it felt like a completely different vibe. So all this sort of animal lore aside, let's talk about some of the mythos now. Because this is the very first Redwall book, Matthias really seems to be your classical Joseph Campbell-style hero, kind of like Luke Skywalker again in the original Star Wars. He starts out as this nobody, and then he follows the wise man, Methuselah, kind of like Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original Star Wars. He learns about a legend. So like Luke learns about the legend of the Jedi, uh, Matthias learns about the legend of Martin the Warrior. Like Luke learns about the legend of this mythical weapon, the lightsaber, Matthias must seek out the sword of Martin the Warrior. In the classical legend, the hero has to fight a dragon. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if Luke has a dragon per se, but Matthias certainly does. He fights a snake. Asmodeus. And then he has to defeat a sort of more human villain. So, you know, Luke comes up against Darth Vader. Matthias comes up, up against this evil rat, Clooney the Scourge. And then, of course, there's also the element of falling in love, which happens in this book with Cornflower the Mace, Mouse. What makes Red Bull somewhat different from your completely archetypal hero stories, however, is that Matthias's personal heroism doesn't necessarily matter that much. So Matthias follows this quasi-mystical quasi journey. He seeks out an ancient sword. It's never really clear if the sword is actually this magical thing that will bring a huge advantage to Red Bull or just Matthias believes in this and Methuselah sort of entertains the idea, yeah, let's save our heritage sword for this abbey. But it, it turns out that Redwall actually has a lot of badass fighters. You don't really need a mystical hero or a special weapon to save the day. So on the one hand, I kind of find this to be a, a plot hole. And one of my problems with these books is it feels like with so many of the characters being able to be brave warriors, they're kind of interchangeable. I, it's also a kind of a plot hole because at the beginning of the book, it suggested that Redwall Abbey is, introduces this place that has known peace for years and the residents have unlimited mercy. Yet, you know, one of their most prominent residents, Const Constant the Badger, seems pretty competent at mercilessly killing her enemies, you know, Quentin Tarantino, Kill Bill style. So there are things I don't love about this book. You know, pretty much my criticism of all the Redwall books are kind of ideological because I like my villains to have redemption arcs and Brian Jakes clearly prefers for them to get their just desserts. So even when you have a character like Chicken Hound the Fox who feels more like an anti-hero than a villain or Kill Coney the Ferret who seems like a pretty friendly character, you know, just because he's a ferret, he happens to be on the wrong size. 
Jinx doesn't really care about him. Chicken Hound the Fox gets bitten by a venomous snake, and Kill Coney gets casually chopped in two without a chance to say goodbye. That said, despite his resentment for villains, Jinx clearly remembers all their names and is invested in giving them stories. So you could easily write a spin-off novel, novel about the power struggle within Clooney's army starring the hopeful but doomed second-in-command Red Tooth, the merciless and arrogant despite his very silly name, Cheese Beef. Perhaps worse on the ideological front is that the books have a kind of impatience for sensitivity and pacifism. So one of the repeated lines I can even remember now from the books from when I was a kid, and it comes out in this book as well, is that whenever a character is mourning, the way their friends comfort them is saying, snap out of it. Your friend would be laughing at you. They want you to be out there fighting, not mourning. There are also these repeated references in the books to how a, a hero is cooler if they take no prisoners. You know, I, I think a hero is more humane if they do take prisoners and don't just chop everyone to bits. The worst thing of all with this book is that there's one character who is a consistent pacifist in it all, and it's Abbot Mortimer, you know, the defender of the tradition of the Abbey. And unfortunately, the way the story is told, rather than simply presenting him as a different kind of hero than Matthias, they more kind of present him as a kind of a buffoon who keeps on not seeing the bad things coming and the other residents of Abbey, like Constance the Badger and Jess the Squirrel, kind of laugh at him behind his back. So that said, despite this big ideological gap between Brian Jakes and me, I still find these books very comforting to read. And that may be thanks to an ideological element that Brian Jack Jakes and I have in common. So the heart of these books is the utopia of Redwall Abbey, this place where all kinds of creatures live together and care for each other and tell stories and build on mythology. It's all the beauty of a monastery without the inconveniences of an actual religion. And while I think it's messed up that this abbey doesn't seem to have many true pacifists, I do think it's kind of cool that Matthias was never truly alone in his struggle. There was always Ambrose Spike and Constance the Badger and Winifred the Otter and just a squirrel and an unnamed beaver. That's another thing you won't see in another Redwall books. Brian Jake said after this, no more non-British animals. Redwall is not just an abbey. It's a commune. It's a collective. It's a utopia. And that's why it's such a lovely place to revisit that even me, someone who hates war stories, who doesn't like these vengeance seeking characters, I do feel at peace with them. It feels like this wonderful place to escape to. And that comes back to the weird plot hold in the story that on the one hand, Matthias is this singular hero who saves Redwall with the magical sword. But on the other hand, Redwall doesn't really need Matthias because they have all these characters standing up for each other. So I would very much recommend if you read Redwall in your childhood, going back to this first book, I'm sure there are things you'll like about it, things you'll find a little weird, but because it is the true first book, because Jake's is inventing the idea of this animal, non-religious, monastery, peaceful yet warrior society for the first time, a very digestible book, it's very clear what the story is about, it has this classical hero arc that just makes it very easy to follow along and you're left wondering what animals and what animal traditions will we learn about next. So let me know about your thoughts on Redwall in the comments and I hope to come back with a commentary on the second Redwall book, Mossflower, very soon. Mm -hmm.